Leonardo da Vinci once said, the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. But what does this Renaissance genius have to do with cybersecurity? Find out through amazing stories and insights from CPR Research and get ready to hack like da Vinci. Please welcome our Vice President of Research, Maya Horowitz. Italy, Leonardo da Vinci is born. The man who painted the most expensive artwork in history sold for $450 million. And no, surprisingly, it wasn't her. It was actually him, Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world. But da Vinci was not only a great artist, he was also a passionate researcher. In his lifetime, da Vinci is said to have, to have written over 15 notebooks and, and 28,000 pages, 20% of which survived till this day. Da Vinci said that the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding, but there was one thing he knew absolutely nothing about, cyber attacks. And so today, I want us to try and better understand the cyber threat landscape through the art and science of this Renaissance genius and through some modern checkpoint research discoveries. Some of da Vinci's inventions were advanced military tools and weapons. He designed a giant crossbow capable of firing 12 bolts at once, a huge cannon to shoot 33 uh, arms at once, he also invented a um, chariot with spinning blades to mow down enemy soldiers as he traces through the battlefield. He invented an armored car that serves as a modern tank, armored warships, portable bridges, and more. In the 1480s, da Vinci applied for a job as, the, as a military engineer in the, in the court of Ludvico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. In his application letter, he mentioned all of these inventions, also saying that in times of peace, he can also serve as an architect or as an artist decorating the house of Sforza. He got the job, the Duke became his sponsor, and years later, he's the one who commissioned him to paint The Last Supper. Today's battlefield, unfortunately, still includes cannons, tanks, warships, and other kinetic weapons, but it also includes cybernetic weapons. Two recent wars, one in Eastern Europe and the other in the Middle East, demonstrate the state of the art of cyber weapons as used by threat actors, uh, nation states, and their supporting, uh, supporting activists. We are all aware of the current trend among cyber criminals. They breach networks, leak out data, and then encrypt machines and server, asking for ransom in return. The motivation is very clear, to get money. But for nation states during wartime, the motivation is, of course, very different. They try to cause fear, create damage, uh, to, to stop critical infrastructure. And so the attack remains similar, but still different. They start by breaching a network, leaking out sensitive data, and then the ransomware is replaced with a wiper, simply deleting all the files permanently. In 2022, the main users of this trend were Russia-affiliated um, state-sponsored state uh, sp state uh, hackers. They used no less than nine different wiping tools in, attack, in attacks against numerous organizations in Ukraine. Uh, 
But in 2023, and especially at its last quarter, the focus of these attacks shifted from Russia state actors to Iranian state actors, and especially their Ministry of Intelligence. In one attack, the threat actors used a wiper that they called BB Wiper, after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, to attack organizations in the education and technology sectors in Israel. This wiper had variants for both uh, Windows and Linux, Linux becoming more and more popular among threat actors, especially with ransomware and wiping tools. Another, another threat actor called Malek, uh, you, uh, that is very known for their wiping activities, breached a hospital in northern Israel. And a third group called Cyber Tufan breached and wiped the networks of dozens of Israeli organizations in a supply chain attack. But these attacks don't only focus on Israel. Iranian Ministry of uh, Intelligence also breached and wiped numerous organizations uh, in, uh, in Albania, and specifically government organizations, in response to Albania's support of Mujahideen al khalq uh, which is an Iranian opposition group. And so it is very evident uh, that today wiping tools are becoming more and more popular uh, within nation states uh, during wartime. Then uh, this is something uh, that, that, is, that happens in parallel to their attacks uh, in, the physical, in the physical world. Um, but today it is also clear that these attacks are not very effective uh, in, uh, in affecting the citizens' daily lives, at least when we compare them to the tools and weapons that have been in development for hundreds of years. But still, this is an expansion of nation states' tool set, which will surely keep evolving. Moving on to Vitruvius. Vitruvius was a Roman architect who lived in the first century before Christ. His book, De Architectura, is one of the only remaining evidence from classical antiquity, giving us a glimpse into Roman architecture me architectural methods and, uh, and techniques and materials. Uh, Vitruvius defined the three key qualities in architecture, strength, utility, and beauty. An architectural element should be strong and resilient, should serve its purpose, and should be aesthetically pleasing. And so should the human body, which is why Vitruvius defined the perfect proportions for both architecture and anatomy. In 1490, Da Vinci used Vitruvius's calculations, as well as his own measurements, in drawing his Vitruvian men. The figure's arm span is equal to its height, the height is then eight times the length of the head and seven times the length of the foot. Now, I know it all sounds a bit random, but I actually tried it on myself, and it works. These calculations are accurate. And so da Vinci took the time to investigate the human body uh, in details so that he can perfectly represent that later in his art and in his science. Similarly, Phishing email creators take the time to thoroughly understand what legitimate business emails look like so that they can use, leverage that in their art or in their work, which is to craft phishing emails with the perfect digital illusion of legitimacy, with the perfect subject, sender, and wording of the text. Phishing emails are, of course, one of the most, uh, one of the most popular attack, attack methods um, to infect personal computers. But, uh, but in this case, threat actors used phishing emails to attack mobile devices. This specific, in this specific campaign, the threat actors used, uh, used a mobile malware that we called uh, Fluhorse to attack, uh, to attack employees of large industrial companies as well as government officials in, uh, in, Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia. In one, of these, uh, in one of these attacks, this is the translation of the phishing email. This phishing email is calling the customers of a toll collection company in Taiwan to pay a, uh, to pay a, uh, to pay a toll uh, using their mobile app to be downloaded from the internet. The download domain is very similar to the one of the real toll collection company called FETC. 
And when clicking download to download the app, there's a JavaScript that runs looking for the victim's uh, user agent to check whether or not they are compatible with the attack, uh, namely to check if it's either a Windows mobile device or an Android. If so, the app called FETC.APK would be downloaded. When installed, the app would ask the user for permissions uh, to, to their SMS, uh, which will become handy later on in the attack. At the next stage, we see that it's not only the phishing email and the website that tries to mimic the original one. It is also the apps themselves. The threat actors used an open source tool called Flutter uh, to craft these apps. This is why we called the malware Fluhorse. Uh, and in fact, we were able to identify four different apps leveraged in this attack, each of them targeting a different audience. One of these apps uh, was the Toll Collection app uh, in Taiwan. A second was a banking app in Vietnam. Third was a transportation app in Thailand. And fourth was a dating app in China. Now, each of these legitimate apps had over one million downloads. And so the potential, uh, the potential audience for this attack was very, very wide. When the victim opens the malicious app, they are asked to insert their credentials and or credit card number, uh, and at which point they will be asked to wait as the data is being processed. Of course, at this stage, the details are sent to the attacker's CNC server. They try to use them, and if they are challenged with a two-factor authentication code, it would then be sent to the victim. But of course, since they have SMS permissions, it will also be forwarded to them to be used to complete the theft. And so both Da Vinci and threat actors uh, take, uh, take very close attention to details and try to use them in their work. But while one seeks to create art and elevate humanity, the others seek to exploit it uh, as part of their attacks, showing how details and precision can be used for either noble or malicious aims. In 1515, Francois I was crowned as king of France. And immediately, uh, he conquered Milan in the Battle of Marignano. The wealthy Medici family from Florence then hired da Vinci, asking him to design and build a gift for the French king. And what da Vinci built was incredible. He built a real-size robot of a lion, lions being the symbol of Florence, the Medici's hometown. When presented to the French king, da Vinci turned a key in the lion's back, pulling strings built within the robot, making the robot walk a few steps towards the king. When the king then tapped the lion with his sword, a compartment opened to reveal a fleur de lis, a lily flower, a symbol of the French monarchy. The French king was, of course, very excited about this gift and its creator, uh, and so he asked da Vinci to move, uh, to move with him back to France. And da Vinci accepted. Why he accepted it is not very clear. Some suggest it is, it is because he was threatened by the younger generation of artists like Michelangelo and Raphael, and others suggest he just wanted to retire. Either way, this is how in his elder years, da Vinci found himself living in the French king's court in Amboise, where he died in 1519. According to the legend, he died with King Francois by his deathbed. And so da Vinci, in some cases, not only designed the logic or the software, if you will. In this case, he also designed the actual hardware. Which brings me to the weirdest trend in cyber attacks for this year. The return of the USB stick as an infection method. We identified no less than three different threat actors using USB drives as their main infection vector during the year. One was Raspberry Robin, a cy uh, cyber criminals leveraging USB drives globally to infect machines uh, with, with, this, with this malware, which would usually lead to an infection with ransomware. Second uh, is a Russian uh, espionage group called G uh, Gamma Redon, uh, using USB drives to propagate a worm called Litter Drifter, mostly in Ukraine, uh, but also in the US, Vietnam, Chile, uh, Germany, Poland, and Hong Kong. Uh, and third one, which is the coolest, 
Camera Dragon, a Chinese-based espionage group uh, using USB drives to propagate their, their malware, especially in, uh, um, in Eastern uh, Asia. But we found proof of it also uh, getting, getting uh, elsewhere in the world, probably mistakenly. It all started when our incident response team was called to assist a hospital in the UK infected by this malware. Checkpoint Research then analyzed the malware and the infection chain to reveal this interesting story. Patient zero in the hospital was an employee who had participated in a conference held in Asia. During the conference, he shared his presentation with some fellow attendees using his personal USB drive. Unfortunately, one of his colleagues was infected by the, by the malware, and so upon sharing his, uh, his presentation with them, the USB drive became unknowingly infected. And then, upon returning to the UK and to his workplace, inserting the, and, and using the USB drive, uh, he, he led to the infection uh, of the entire hospital's network. The key to this campaign's success is that this malware is actually a worm, meaning that each infected device uh, will, have, will have this backdoor to download further malware, but will also in, uh, infect any newly introduced USB drive, and so on and so forth. And this is how this little USB drive got the malware all the way from Southeast Asia and into Western Europe, and we found proof of it also landing in Myanmar, India, South Korea, and Russia. Going back to Da Vinci and his lion, they didn't get much further than Italy and France, but then to do the relocation from Italy to France, Da Vinci had to ride a donkey. He did not have modern technology like airplanes or like USB drives. So, was Leonardo Da Vinci an artist? a researcher, an architect, maybe a philosopher. I guess in order to be remembered 500 years later as a genius, it takes all of them. But having such a wide and diverse range of interests also meant that Da Vinci jumped from one project to another, leaving many loose ends, leaving many projects unfinished. He left many sketches without prototypes. He even left the Mona Lisa without proper background details which is why this following quote of his is a bit funny. He said, um, I've, been, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. But this is actually the motivation behind Checkpoint Research. We do not only investigate in order to learn, in order to know. Knowing is not enough. We must protect. We do not only sketch our ideas on old parchment or in our amazing research blog. We do all this research in order to leverage all this knowledge into our products to make sure we provide you, our customers, with the best security in the market. Thank you very much.